Members, the time of 135 plus a little bit having arrived, I'm going to call the March 17th St. Patrick's Day meeting of the uh, House Tax Committee to order and um, pursuant to rules 10.01. And so, Ms. Griska, if you would please call the roll. Mark Hort. Present. Mark Hort, present. Liz Lagarde. Present. Liz Lagarde, present. David. David's present. David's present. Abaje. Present. Abaje, present. Carlson. Carlson, present. Carlson, present. Detmer. Detmer, present. Detmer, present. Garofalo. Garofalo. Sorry. Go Gomez. Gomez, present. Gomez, present. Her. Her. Her toss. Her toss, present. Her toss, present. Howard. Howard. McDonald. McDonald here. McDonald present. Miller. Miller. Moran. Present. Moran present. Mortensen. Present. Mortensen present. Robbins. Robbins. Sundell. Present. Sundell present. Schultz. Present. Schultz present. Stevenson. Present. Stevenson present. Swazinski. Here. Swazinski present. Joachim. Present. Joachim present. Garofalo. Her. Howard. Miller, Robbins, we have a quorum. Thank you very much, Ms. Griska. We do have a quorum. And before we new, move to the next order of business, I have two announcements to make. Uh, one is that we uh, can go until 2.50 uh, today. So if we, uh, at this point, if we do not complete at 2.50, uh, we'll recess and come back tonight at an undetermined time at this point. Then the second announcement I have is uh, news reports are that the IRS is going to extend the tax filing deadline to May 15th. And so that's, I'm just reading that uh, coming through. And so uh, this would actually be the second time it's been delayed uh, this year. So. Uh, in January, the IRS announced that they would not start the filing season until February 12th because they had that bill that was signed in the law December 27th. And of course, the Department of Revenue, for administrative reasons, followed suit. So we'll wait to get for sure confirmation, but uh, it looks like right now it's a fairly sure thing that the IRS is going to delay filing by one month uh, until May 15th. Um, to adjust for their recently passed uh, Recovery Act. So with that, uh, Representative Les Lagarde, have you reviewed the March 16th, 2021 minutes? So move, Mr. Chair. Representative Les Lagarde moves approval of the March 16th, 2021 uh, minutes. Any thoughts or comments on those minutes? If not, members, I'll ask you to temporarily mute yourselves as we take the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Uh, the motion does prevail. The March 16th, 2021 minutes of the Taxes Committee are approved. Members, we have four bills on the agenda. The first bill is House File 572, Representative Morrison. Would someone like to move Representative Morrison's bill? 
I will, Mr. Chair. Representative Joaquin moves House File 572 to be laid over for possible inclusion into the tax omnibus bill. Representative Morrison, welcome to the committee and please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and happy to St. Patrick's Day. Thank I you appreciate very the opportunity. You. I, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to present an important bill that will give critical support to solving the youth tobacco epidemic. Reducing tobacco's harm is a public health success story. Today, we all enjoy smoke-free air, and tens of thousands of Minnesotans have broken their addiction to cigarettes. Unfortunately, though, our work is not done. As a physician myself and a mother and a Minnesotan, I'm deeply concerned about youth tobacco use. We were so close to raising a generation free from tobacco addiction. But e-cigarettes have created a whole new health crisis among our kids and young adults. And smoking rates remain high in communities targeted by the tobacco industry, including Black, American Indian, and LGBTQ people. Every year, Minnesota loses 6,300 residents and $7 billion to smoking. Just recently, the Minnesota Department of Health released new Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey data that unfortunately reinforces what we already know. Minnesota's kids are using e-cigarettes at epidemic levels. The survey found that one in five high schoolers use e-cigarettes in the past month. To make matters worse, more than 70% of youth e-cigarette users are showing signs of nicotine dependence. More Minnesota youth are frequent e-cigarette users and these products are being used with greater intensity. Couple that with the fact that we are in the middle of a respiratory pandemic and that Clearway Minnesota will soon end. And it's very clear we need to do more to prevent youth tobacco use and to treat tobacco addiction. Last year, the state of Minnesota collected about $600 million in tobacco taxes. It's appropriate to dedicate some of those tobacco tax revenues to tobacco prevention and treatment. Currently, there are two existing dedications, neither of which is related to tobacco prevention. This bill would add a third dedication to invest in existing tobacco prevention efforts that are significantly underfunded. To achieve that goal, House File 572 dedicates $15 million annually to the Minnesota Department of Health for tobacco prevention and treatment activities. This bill was heard last week by the Health Finance and Policy Committee and it passed unanimously. This year, I introduced two other bills to fund tobacco prevention. One appropriates general fund revenue and another dedicates delinquent settlement payment. Together with this bill to dedicate cigarette taxes, these bills provide the legislature with three good options to increase our investment in reducing the harm of commercial tobacco. As part of the 1998 tobacco settlement, Clearway Minnesota was created. They have provided the vast majority of tobacco prevention and treatment funding in our state. Clearway Minnesota will sunset at the end of this year, leaving a significant funding gap. The time is now for us to address this cliff. In 2019, the legislature came together to fund our quit tobacco programs known as quit partner. That was part one. Part two is the legislature picking up the tobacco prevention baton from Clearway Minnesota. For the sake of our kids, neighbors, economy, and healthcare costs, we need to pick that baton up and not drop it. In addition to addressing the youth tobacco epidemic, funding tobacco prevention and treatment will help us combat systemic racism and tobacco-related health disparities. As you know, last year, the, health the House Select Committee on Racial Justice issued recommendations for making Minnesota a more equitable and just state. One suggestion was to invest in more tobacco control. I appreciate the opportunity to hear this bill. Investing in tobacco prevention will pay dividends by lowering smoking rates, preventing youth addiction, and easing health disparities. With that kind of investment, we all win. And Mr. Chair, I do have um, Molly Moylanen here from Clearway to testify also. Thank you very much, Representative Morrison. And the <laughs> estimate is there is uh, no additional cost. It's a $15 million transfer from one fund uh, to another. So testifiers, again, if you could uh, limit yourself to three minutes, please. And with that, Molly Moylanen, if you would please state your name and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Molly Moylanen and I serve as Vice President of Clearway, Minnesota, an independent nonprofit working to reduce tobacco's harm. I also co-chair Minnesotans for a Smoke-Free Generation, a coalition of more than 60 organizations committed to ending youth tobacco addiction. 
For the past 20 years, Clearway, Minnesota has led a comprehensive effort to prevent commercial tobacco use through education campaigns, research, free quit smoking help, and community partnerships. The legislature has been a strong bipartisan partner in these efforts, passing smoke-free air, funding quit smoking services, and most recently, Tobacco 21. Our collective work has saved thousands of lives, prevented thousands of cancers, and saved Minnesota more than $5 billion. If Minnesota continues funding tobacco prevention at current levels or higher, we can save another 14,000 lives and 10 billion in healthcare costs. Clearing Minnesota was created as a life limited organization and we will sunset at the end of this year. As we reach our sunset, tobacco remains a threat, especially when it comes to the youth e-cigarette epidemic and racial disparities. Tobacco taxes and settlement fees are a huge source of revenue in Minnesota. Last year alone, Minnesota collected nearly $760 million in tobacco revenues, yet the state only spent one penny of each dollar of tobacco revenue on prevention and treatment. With this bill, we'd spend about two or three pennies on these life-saving efforts. Sustainable tobacco prevention funding, no matter how we do it, will create a healthier future for Minnesota. HF 572 is one option that we strongly support. Thank you to lawmakers from both parties and chambers for supporting these efforts. We are committed to working with all of you to solve our state's tobacco prevention gap this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Moylanen. Uh, is there anyone else uh, from the public or on the Zoom that would like to speak for or against? Uh, House file 572. Seeing none, uh, members? Any questions or comments for the author? Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, say a question for the author. Uh, I'm just, it's very great efforts that you uh, put forth in this bill, but I'm just curious with the House majority DFL proposing marijuana, uh, legalizing it, and the smoking and the harms that we know that uh, happens and becomes, uh, just wonder what your position on, on that as a physician professionally. Is that something I should support uh, along with this bill or maybe stay away from tobacco altogether? Uh, Representative Morrison, and you don't have to advise another member how they should vote, but Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative McDonald. Uh, this, that is not related to this bill. I strongly encourage you to join me in the fight to prevent youth tobacco use. Representative McDonald. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Representative Morrison. Uh, I just do, uh, maybe just a comment, I do find it, uh, ironic that uh, the House majority that you belong to is uh, supporting legalizing marijuana on one hand with flavored tobacco in marijuana, and on the other hand, uh, coming up with a bill to uh, curtail and eliminate youth tobacco use, or any tobacco use for that matter, but especially the youth. So uh, it is um, definitely ironic to me, and um, we'll see how this plays out as the session continues. But uh, I guess I'll take your advice on that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question: During the testimony, did she, did the 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 author of the bill, what did she say that tobacco use is going up or going down right now? Representative Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, uh, e-cigarette use is increasing right now. Representative so, do e-cigarettes cause cancer? Representative Morrison. Mr. Chair and Representative, there is ongoing research, uh, but we are currently conducting a massive public health experiment on our children. So, um, Representative Swazinski. Okay, and then just, uh, so would this bill specifically, you know, if, if rates are currently climbing with use, whether they're using these e-cigarettes or regular cigarettes, um, is, you talked about Clearway, um, is that gonna be the main benefactor of this? 
So, nope. and Representative Morrison, before you answer, could you either get a little close? I'm having a tough time hearing you. The volume, you're clear, but the volume isn't very loud. I don't know if you get any closer how to make that. It might be just me, but Representative Morrison. Can you hear me now, Mr. Chair? That is better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, Clearway has been an incredible partner and came out of the tobacco settlements in 1998. And Clearway is sunsetting this year, so we will lose that partnership, and we may we risk losing the incredible gains we've made, decreasing youth tobacco use. I, I think that answered your question, Representative Swazinski. Okay, and this bill would fund them more, uh, Representative Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Swazinski, this bill would take. Uh, money that we already collect from cigarette taxes and move $15 million of it into a fund to replace uh, the Clearway funding that we currently have. So no new taxes here. And Representative Morrison, it, it goes to the Minnesota Department of Health. Is that right? Mr. Chair, that's correct. Okay. Representative Swazinski. That's all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Or Representative Chair, Gomez. Chair, I guess I just I felt the need to chime in a little bit because I worked pretty extensively on the um, regulated adult use cannabis bill. So I just I I I, I know I'm I'm going to keep it really brief, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say there there are no flavored tobacco products that are proposed to be allowed in regu in regulated cannabis for adult use. That's a misconception. Um, the uh, unregulated cannabis is responsible for some of the vaping disease that we saw in our state. It's very available to young people. So what we're trying to do with that bill is to ensure that cannabis that is consumed in the state of Minnesota by adults is regulated and safe. Thank you. Uh, Representative da uh, Chair Davids. Now, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. And this, this, these arguments are quite uh, silly, really, if you think about it. Uh, it's okay for Democrats to smoke pot, but Republicans can't have cigarettes. Uh, the CDC has said that the, many of the same chemicals in cigarettes are in pot. So on the one hand, we want to smoke pot, we want to smoke dope, but you can't have a cigarette. That, that makes no sense to me. And, you know, I think someone said that tobacco use is increasing. Uh, you know, that just shows that Clearway, Minnesota has completely failed in their mission, and it's good that they're being sunsetted. Uh, my question for the author is, is if $15 million goes away and into the Department of Health, who is the loser on this? There's, there's no net gain. I understand that there's no new taxes. But if $15 million is going into the Department of Health, who is it coming from? Representative Morrison, um, how would that work? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Davids, I think I would defer to Ms. Moylanin for that question. So, it, I mean, my understanding is that would be out of a general fund cost. Is that right, Representative Morrison? Uh, Mr. Chair, I assume that that's the case. So, uh, represent, uh, Chair Davids. Well, well, thank you. So, if that's the case, we're taking money out of uh, education, taking care of the homeless, and a lot of programs to go into programs at the Department of Health that simply don't work. We've seen what a failure Clearway, Minnesota has been. So why would we put more money in for tobacco cessation when rates are going up? Uh, it's just money down the money down the drain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Ms. Moynihan, I, I guess since your your organization was mentioned there by Chair Davids. If you would like to respond to his comments, I will allow that. Well, let's see, Chair Davids and members, I would take issue with the, with the comments there. I think together in partnership with the legislature and other organizations we made tremendous progress at reducing tobacco's harm in the state of Minnesota. Our youth smoking rate is at an all-time low and under 3%. And we have seen an increase in e-cigarette e use all over the country and here in Minnesota. Our efforts have to continue to fight back against an industry that continues to target youth and other marginalized communities. So there is more work to be done. 
but together we've made great progress. And what this bill will do is dedicate existing tobacco tax revenue to underfunded programs at the department to help fill the gap when it comes to youth prevention and tobacco cessation. Thank you. Representative Morrison, anything you'd like to add on that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate Ms. Moylan's work and her comments. Um, but I Clearway, there's some evidence that Clearway has been a tremendous success, and I really hope that everyone will join me in continuing our fight to prevent youth tobacco use. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and my name was Mr. used Davis. I believe here. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I'm getting conflicting messages. We're saying that we're saying that tobacco usage is up, but yet it's at an all-time low. How does that work, Mr. Chairman? Does someone want to clarify that? Representative Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Davids, thank you for the clarifying question. If I'm hoping you can hear me. I'm seeing someone leaning towards the computer. Uh, the youth tobacco, youth cigarette use is way down. Youth e-vaping youth is is on the rise. That's the distinction I think that we're that you're looking for there. Chair Davids. Well, th uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank thank you for that. But um, you know what this bill does is it takes money out of education, takes money out of uh, helping the homeless get get uh, shelter, it takes money out of food programs for the poor to a program that doesn't work it, it doesn't work so I, I think it's not a very good idea here but uh what do i know thanks mr chairman thank you um chair joaquin thank you mr chair and i just want to thank representative morrison for bringing this bill forward and to thank clearway for the work they've done over the years tobacco use is down the problem is is that the big tobacco companies who clearly are making a profit if they're paying $600 million in taxes to Minnesota a year, have found a niche market in e-cigarettes, which is increasing among our youth. And that is very, very worrisome. So there is still work to do. Clearway has done a job with the money they receive from the tobacco settlement. They're being phased out. I think this bill just merely says part of those $600 million of tobacco taxes should be brought to the Minnesota Department of Health to make sure that we continue um, the work that they have, that Clearway has started to make sure that our youth are now not falling prey to the advertising and marketing of the big tobacco companies that have now found their niche, niche market in e-cigarettes. So just wanna thank Representative Morrison for that. Thank you much, Representative Detmer. <laughs> Representative Detmer, you're muted. There we go. There we go. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and a question for Clearways uh, testifier. Uh, you said that the smoking of our youth is going down. How do you how do you evaluate that? How do you get those statistics, especially now that most kids haven't been in school to maybe answer a survey or whatever? But uh, how's how do you get that those statistics? Uh, Representative Morris, uh, Morrison or Ms. Moylanen, who would like to answer that? I can, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Go Mr. ahead, Ms. Moylanen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Detmer. There are two student surveys in Minnesota where the state is collected. One is the student Minnesota Student Survey, and the second is the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey. And the most recent data we have that was just recently released from the Department of Health um, is from the 2020 Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey. Um, it was collected last year before the schools and everywhere else shut down. And so the data set is solid and those are the latest data we have. Um, in terms of youth tobacco use since the pandemic, there, you know, we're learning more about that mostly through anecdotes, but it sounds like more youth are continuing to vape and to use e-cigarettes at home um, during the stressful time. Uh, Representative Detmer. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, I tend to agree with uh, Chair Davids regarding uh, the, the source of our of that funding that's coming uh, into this program. Uh, I think Very that good. money can be well spent in, in the areas uh, from the general, general fund also into those areas that uh, mentioned by uh, Chair Davids. 
Thank you. Thank you. We will go to uh, Chair Moran, and then we will go back to the author. Chair Moran. Um, thank you, Chair Marquardt. Um, I just want to say that, you know, this is an issue that I have also supported and, and carried bills on this. And, you know, we just like to say that uh, Clearway has really been leading the way to a smoke-free Minnesota for a smoke-free generation. Just for some information for those on this phone who, who seem to believe, I mean, on the phone, <laughs> on this Zoom who, who seem to believe that uh, Clearway has no value. They, in, in their research, one of the things that they found out that our statewide smoke-free laws, which first passed in 2007, had a positive ripple effect that extended from public spaces to people's personal lives. When the law passed uh, in our rest, you remember that law passed, you know, that this debate we had around no smoking in the restaurants? And the impact that that would have, and it would just devastate, you know, uh, business, uh, restaurant business, that they would just flee the, the state of Minnesota. Well, when that law passed uh, and our restaurant and bars went smoke free, calls to quick plan services and other quit smoking helplines rose dramatically. The, per the percentage of smoke free homes also significantly increased. In 2007, 83% of Minnesotans didn't allow smoking in their homes, and less than half of smokers kept their houses smoke-free. Today, we have 92% 90, of Minnesota homes are completely smoke-free, including 60% of smoker homes. And so I just raised that because, one, we are a clean, a much more cleaner environment because of the work of Clear Waters, Restaurants are still thriving. People are still coming there to eat and drink and have a good time. They did not go out of business. And you know, um, our kids are dependent on us. Our children, our young people are, de are uh, dependent on us as adults to help lead them in the, in, in the right directions. In regards to e-cigarettes, e-cigarettes, aerosol, do contain harmful chemicals. E-cigarettes, aerosol, contain harmful chemicals. Um, they do have nicotine in, in them. You know, just in case we was wondering, it, is, it, it does cause cancer. It has uh, cancer-causing chemicals embedded in the e-cigarettes. And so we as legislators, we just got to be, you know, in my mind, you know, a little bit more um, responsible. We can also support education. We can um, support a very strong healthcare system. We can do all of that and also continue to work and continue to have clear, safe environments in this area that this bill is talking about for the purposes on knowing that e-cigarettes do have an impact of, in our younger generation they are uh, utilizing the e-cigarettes e in larger numbers than ever. And that we as adults, as we do for our children, our own children, have to be responsible as a state lawmakers to work to ensure that we not, are not only protecting our own children, but are protecting young folks around the state of Minnesota. So I highly support um, uh, uh, Representative Morrison bill. It is a good a bill. The work of Clearway has clearly informed us as legislators, have clearly informed residents across the state of Minnesota. And from that, the impact, it has caused just better health impact overall. So, um, you know, we need organizations like Clearwater to continue to help in us be effective legislators in this area. So um, I hope others will join us in supporting this bill. Thank you, Chair Marquardt. Thank you. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, wanted to clarify something. I think it was spoken earlier. I think uh, Chairwoman Weakim uh, stated that the tax 
is paid by the tobacco companies. Uh, the tax incident studies that have been done in Minnesota um, don't actually prove that out to be true. Uh, they estimate that I think it's 90 to 95 percent of taxes on corporations or business, whether they're tobacco or grocery stores, are actually paid by the consumer. So the tobacco companies don't actually pay these taxes, they collect these taxes. So just a tax incident study clarification on the conversation we're having today. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we need to look at those numbers. I don't know if it's quite that high, but uh, there certainly is a, a shift down to the consumer, no doubt. Uh, Representative McDonald, and then Representative Joachim's name had been mentioned. Uh, Representative McDonald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for Representative Moran. Uh, you mentioned in your- uh... Uh, Representative McDonald, no, we're not. If you've got a question, we're, this isn't the health committee, this is the tax committee, and I have loud leeway, but if you've got a question for the author at this point, uh, go ahead, but not another member, unless, unless your name had been called. Oh, very good. I thought I heard my name, but uh, it could be the uh, bad uh, broadband out here in Delano. All right. Well, very good then, Mr. Chair. That's fine. Uh, one of the uh, comments that I heard was that we need to be responsible in uh, as Minnesotans, and I presume that, that she meant that we need to support this bill being responsible. I don't think it's responsible uh, to uh, support this bill if we're going to indeed support uh, legalizing marijuana where it's uh, also flavored marijuana. I don't think that is responsible. Uh, so I think the two are at uh, odds with each other and uh, just negate. This bill would completely negate the marijuana bill, completely negate this bill whatsoever. And I agree with Chair Davis, the money could be spent elsewhere. Matter of fact, you probably will have to use it to uh, um, for um, those who could be, uh, if we do pass marijuana, uh, using to marijuana in the youth youth marijuana use. So I'll just make that comment then, Mr. Chair. Representative Joachim will have the final word on House File 572, which is being considered by the committee at this time. Chair Joachim. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, say I'll check out the tax incident study, but bottom line is I think uh, we still have work to do, members, and I think we should be supporting Representative Morrison's bill. Thank you very much. Uh, to the author of the bill, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members for the opportunity to present House Pile 572. We have relied on Clearway for more than 20 years uh, to do prevention services for youth and others in our state. This is really a watershed moment for us. We have to replace and continue the work that they've done so that we can continue the progress that, that their good work has made. I really hope that everyone will join me in supporting uh, this no new tax way to fund tobacco prevention for our youth. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Representative Morrison, thank you so much. And uh, Representative Joachim renews her motion to lay over House File 572 for possible inclusion into the House Tax Ominous Bill. Representative Morrison, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> We'll move on to the next bill. That is House Bill 998. Representative Schultz, would you like to move your bill? Yes, I'll move, I'll move House Bill 998. Representative Schultz moves House Bill 998 to be laid over for possible inclusion into the House Omnibus Tax Bill. Which, would you like to move your A1 amendment at this time? Um, I'll move the A1 amendment. Representative Schultz moves the A1 amendment. Um, tell us about your amendment, if you would, please. The amendment caps the, the amount to $10 million and also includes counties, and this was adopted in the Senate as well. Uh, very good. So um, any thoughts or comments from members on the A1 amendment? If not, members, I'm going to call for the vote on the A1 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The uh, motion does prevail. The A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Schultz to House File 998 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. House File 998 as amended is a bill we've heard before. It was included in last session's tax bill in 2016. The Workforce and Affordable Home Ownership Development Program was established for the purpose 
to award home ownership grants, and this bill includes grants and loans to nonprofit organizations, certain community land trusts in order to develop workforce and affordable home ownership projects. This is a great need in greater Minnesota. We've had bipartisan support. I wanna thank Representative Davids for his support and Senator Senjum carry, is carrying this bill in the Senate. And the goal is to increase the supply of workforce and affordable home owner-occupied housing in Minnesota. And it uses um, uh, increases in um, our funds for the, from the mortgage uh, registry tax and the deed tax. So when there's an increase in that, that those funds will be um, put into this account. And the amendment basically limits that account because if you look at the revenue note, I think there's $75 million. This amendment that we just adopted would limit that to $10 million. And you can see the projections also. Um, um, Ms. Schill has information on the projections of the growth in the mortgage registry and deed tax that we can discuss. But I'm gonna turn it over to my testifier, Jeff Corey, and I'm gonna ask him to limit his testimony to two minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Schultz. And just for members, there is, uh, Ms. Schill did prepare, prepare a document you have on the state mortgage registry and deed transfer tax uh, collections. Uh, so uh, we have Jeff Corey. Uh, Mr. Corey, if you would please identify yourself and welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Chair Marquardt and Representative Schultz and members. Uh, my name is Jeff Corey. I'm the Executive Director at One Roof Community Housing in Duluth. I um, want to start by saying thank you to Chair Marquardt for inclusion in last year's House tax bill of, of this bill. Uh, Representative Schultz for, for your continued support of this initiative and Representative Davids and Gomez for previous support of this bill. Um, a little bit about One Roof, uh, our, the organization for whom I work. We're located in Duluth and serve surrounding communities, including those in Carleton, St. Louis, Lake, and Cook counties. Um, we have several lines of business. One is education and counseling, where we help homeowner, home buyers prepare uh, to buy homes through education and, and counseling. Another, uh, also, we provide education and counseling for tenants and landlords. Uh, we do lending, primarily um, loans to uh, uh, families that are not bankable to be able to improve their, their homes that they already own. We do some multifamily development and we do some single family development, which is owner occupied development, which is primarily community land trust homes. We have about 315 community land trust homes. And during the last uh, 20 years, we've seen about 190 resales of those homes. So we've served over 500 families in our service area with uh, community land trust home ownership. We like to tell folks we make home a better place. Uh, the reason we say that is because home is really the platform that gives households the stability that they need to be able to realize their potential. Uh, this is important for all people, but it's most important for children. Um, I, I'm part of a, a coalition that has been working on this initiative. We call ourselves Home Ownership Minnesota. Uh, that home, uh, that, that group includes 13 organizations from around the state representing 75% of the counties in Minnesota. My colleagues in that coalition are experts in the preparation of home buyers, uh, production and preservation of home ownership opportunities, and we have a long-term goal of creating 500 affordable ownership units per year. Presently, uh, the state of Minnesota funds a little under 100 uh, new affordable home ownership units annually, and our, so our short-term goal is to get that number to 200. Um, we're aware that at this time, there are 30,000 affordable rental units in the state of Minnesota that are occupied by families, affordable rental units that are occupied by families who could afford to purchase a home if there were homes available to them. There, the, the market, as we all know, is super tight right now. Um, this would free up rental units for more new households to be able to rent them. Uh, it's important to understand that two-thirds of those 30,000 homes, rental homes, are in greater Minnesota where it's much easier to create home ownership units than, than it is to create new rental units. Um, and another thing I wanted to point out is that new home ownership units can typically be created for about a third of the state investment that it costs to create the equal amount of rental units. Uh, so what, one final thing I wanted to point out um, relative to the work that my colleagues and I do is that we're, we're all aware of the home ownership ratio being much lower for folks of color, for BIPOC households in particular. 
Um, 50% of the households that are my colleagues and I serve in greater Minnesota are, are BIPOC households. Uh, in the metro area, that number goes up all the way to 80%. Uh, I, we do a great job of serving those households. And um, we one of the ways that we could make progress on homeownership disparities is, is to create more units. Uh, we're looking for a variety of different sources of funding um, to get to this 200 units a year. This is just w one of them, but we need to be able to count on funding to be there in order to put systems in place to increase our construction and development efforts. Um, so uh, we, we would really appreciate your support of this bill and we think it's entirely appropriate that during times of economic growth where there's <clears throat> more revenue captured by the state from real estate and home sales activity, that part of that growth gets shared with um, folks who don't have the ability to partake in the American dream of owning homes of their own, and particularly for BIPOC households. Um, thank you kindly for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. Is there anyone else uh, on the Zoom or in the audience that would like to uh, uh, testify on House File 998 as amended? Seeing none, members, any questions for the author of the testifier? I do not see any. Uh, Representative Schultz, to your bill. Thank you, Chair Marquardt, and thank you, members. I also want to note that Representative Fabian, former Representative Fabian, was the original author of this legislation, so I want to make sure we gave him credit. And I also just want to highlight that Minnesota has the second worst racial home ownership gap in the nation. African Americans have only 24% of home ownership and whites have 76%. So we have a long way to go. This bill will help address that issue. And also that home ownership is so important to intergenerational wealth. So it's really important that we get individuals, especially people in our BIPOC communities into home ownership to help future generations. So I, I urge your support. Thank you very much. And Representative Schultz uh, renews her motion to lay over House File 998 as amended for possible inclusion into the House Tax Omnibus Bill. Thank you very much, Representative Schultz. Uh, next on the agenda, Representative Gomez, House File 1791. Would you like to move the bill? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move um, House File 1791 be held over for possible inclusion in the Very tax good. Amendment. And Representative uh, Gomez, would you like to move your A2 amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Representative Gomez moves the A2 amendment. Uh, would you like to speak to the A2 amendment, please, Representative? Absolutely. So the A2 amendment clarifies some um, language in, in the earlier part of the bill and adds a report um, to the bill. This was kind of developed in consultation with Representative New Brindley, who's the GOP lead on my committee, and Representative Albright, who is um, the GOP lead on our home committee. Um, it was a couple suggestions from them. Thank you very much. Is there any uh, comments to the A2 uh, amendment from members? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote on the A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion does prevail. The A2 amendment is adopted. Representative Gomez to House File 1791 is amended. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so I'm the chair of the Preventing Homelessness Division, um, sort of the originating committee for this bill. Um, and in my capacity and during my time as a representative, especially last summer when hundreds of unsheltered people um, were camped in my local parks near my house, um, you know, I, I, but I have a, the chance to hear from people who are directly impacted by homelessness quite a bit. And, um, you know, as the parent of a school-aged kid, I've got to say the stories of from families and from parents of trying to just do those basic things, keep your kid like warm, safe, fed, um, while experiencing homelessness or housing instability hit especially hard and have really stuck with me as I've endeavored to undertake this work this year. Um, you know, thinking as a mom myself, just about like trying to make the basic things happen while you're staying in a car with your little ones or staying on a friend's floor or living in a homeless shelter. Um, it feels impossibly hard. Uh, and then like, how do you get them to school? And once you get them to school, how does your, your little one, how are they supposed to focus if they don't know where they're gonna lay their head at night? Um, 
you know, it's a lot of stress. It's too much stress to put on kids. And this is the reality for 10,000 families across Minnesota each year experience homelessness or housing instability. Um, House file in 1791 would provide aid to counties based on their share of the population of homeless students reported to the Department of Education each year. Um, the counties could then use these funds themselves or grant them out to other tribal, public, or nonprofit entities or coalitions of those entities, which is usually how these services end up being delivered. Um, and ultimately, you know, the service is really about rental assistance and wraparound services to ensure that families can stay stably housed. Um, this would help all 10,000 of those families each year, which would make us a national leader in ending school age homelessness. Um, you know, the cost of inadequate action on child homelessness is incredibly high. Uh, Wilder Foundation does this like annual um, survey of people experiencing homelessness and more than a third of the adults that they interviewed last year, or I think, it was, or maybe it was in 2017 was the last uh, data that I saw, but 36% of them have had their first episode of homelessness before the age of 18 with their families. There are real major, you know, future material costs to our public benefit systems, our medical and criminal justice systems if we don't act. Because once people experience one episode of homelessness, as a child, they are much more likely to experience homelessness throughout their lives. Um, so, you know, these costs are direct in our school districts, in our public systems, they're indirect in the foregone um, tax revenue that results when we allow children in our communities to fall through the cracks and not achieve financial independence. Um, we heard from uh, several uh, units of local government in my committee about the economic case for housing security. And we had a number of counties from across the state specifically talk about how the lack of housing security is having a disproportionate impact on the cost of those support services that they provide directly to residents of Minnesota, which leads to a trend of increasing levies that you can attribute to to increasing human service budget items. Um, and the Association of Minnesota Counties uh, has a letter that should be in members' packets. Um, this is a bill has a real, gives us a real opportunity to reduce those long-term spending, those long-term costs, and to relieve the burdens on our systems. Um, so we're going to hear from two testifiers. One is, our, is from our interagency council on homelessness here at the state, who's gonna help kind of contextualize the picture of of school-age homelessness across the state. And second, we're gonna hear from Dr. Stephen Foldis, who completed a, um, or has, has a research that he's been doing on um, a, a slightly different population, but they're older unaccompanied youth, so they're not youth with their families. But it was, it, it really, his, his research really speaks not just to the direct accounting for the cost of youth homelessness on our systems, but it also speaks to, from a kind of business financial perspective, what we lose as a society when we fail to intervene, when we see that young people are in danger of not experiencing that independence. Um, so that's, that we can move to testifiers this year. Thank you very much, Representative Gomez. So we have Eric Rumdahl, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Representative Gomez asked me to just summarize what we know about student homelessness. And in particular, what I'm gonna share with you is really about uh, pre-K through 12 student homelessness. So I'll just and please share introduce my... yourself if you would, please, for the record. All right, I hope you're able to see those slides. Yeah, would you please identify yourself for the record, please? Yes, uh, I'm Eric Grumdahl with the Interagency Council on Homelessness. And um, I'm here to just share some background information about student homelessness pre-K through 12 in Minnesota. The, uh, the Interagency Council on Homelessness is a cabinet level body led by the Lieutenant Governor and comprised of the heads of uh, these cabinet agencies, the focus of which is really to drive state policy around preventing and ending homelessness with the vision of achieving housing stability for all Minnesotans. Uh, the first thing to note about student homelessness is that it is much more widely uh, distributed and at a higher volume than, than I think most Minnesotans imagine. The map on your screen shows a pinpoint for every school that identified a student experiencing homelessness. And as you can see in the distribution of those dots, this really does cut across all of Minnesota's geography 
uh, almost 1,200 schools in over 300 school districts from 77 of Minnesota's 87 counties. We also see uh, significant disproportionality in homelessness generally in terms of who's impacted by homelessness with great overrepresentation uh, among our uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, as well as uh, LGBTQ uh, communities and uh, people with disabilities. Those disparities, just focusing in on the racial disparities in particular, uh, the racial and ethnic disparities depicted here in the green bars are the student uh, the, the students experiencing homelessness uh, population. The blue bars are the entire student body in Minnesota's public and charter schools. And as you can see, uh, the um, both Hispanic, Black, and uh, American Indian populations are vastly overrepresented uh, compared to the, the overall student body. The number of students experiencing homelessness is measured by schools through a uh, really two processes. Once on October 1st, uh, they record any student that has been identified as uh, experiencing homelessness uh, that, that's enrolled on October 1st, and they continue to document the number of students experiencing homelessness throughout the course of the year. Typically, so the numbers that are on the screen in front of you are those October 1st counts, which really represent just that day of October 1st enrollment. When we look over the course of an entire school year, we see that this number almost doubles. The schools identifying these students is a federal requirement under the McKinney-Vento Act, and it's also a really important um, connection for those students to entitlements that they receive under the federal McKinney-Vento Act to stay, stay engaged in their school, to receive support with transportation. And so there's a very strong uh, benefit and incentive to, to having schools be able to identify those students. And, um, and as you can see, those numbers have grown uh, uh, quickly. In fact, from the 2007 to 2008 school year through the 2000. 15-16 uh, school year, that was a 15% annual growth rate. Uh, we, ha we have a lot of evidence about the educational and other impacts that homelessness has on uh, students, and uh, there's been some pretty remarkable and groundbreaking work conducted here in Minnesota and in partnership with a number of school districts. Uh, what the, the uh, graph that you're seeing on your screen now shows the math proficiency uh, scores for uh, three student groups, the entire student body on the left, the free or reduced lunch uh, student, uh, student group that is not experiencing homelessness, and the students experiencing homelessness. So those are the three groups. Each bar has four sections. The bottom two so, sections mean- Mr. Grumdahl, uh, Mr. Yes, Grumdahl, so- um, you're over three minutes, and I'm going to go a little bit, but this is mainly a, a tax committee, and, and it's good to get a background and so forth, but uh, try if you could wrap up here in a couple minutes. I just have one more slide after this one. Okay, sorry. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and so the, the point of this graph is just to show that even compared to other students in poverty, students experiencing homelessness, uh, their math proficiency in third grade is uh, significantly lower, 33% lower. And we see similar results in terms of reading. And then the last thing to share is just that the, um, the mobility in uh, uh, schools attended by students experiencing homelessness, even with the supports that exist to keep them connected to their school of origin, is really significant. So, uh, as you can see here, the the only sixty percent of school of students uh, experiencing homelessness actually remain in a single school uh, for an entire school year. Uh, so, with that, uh, I'll stand by for any questions and uh, happy to turn this back to you, Representative Gomez. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Grumdahl. Uh, Dr. Foldis. Uh, welcome to the committee, and if you could uh, limit your comments to three minutes, please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Representative uh, Marquardt and uh, Representative Gomez and members of the committee. I'm here to describe a compelling business case for public expenditures to prevent youth homelessness, an opportunity that is not well understood. Why? Because until recently, we have been unaware of the comprehensive long-term cost to taxpayers of homelessness. I am Stephen Foldis, an independent uh, research consultant and an adjunct associate professor of epidemiology and community health at the University of Minnesota. Together with an economist, I conducted a study of these costs for a sample of 1,451 unaccompanied homeless youth 
in Minneapolis that I'll review very briefly. We added up the comprehensive taxpayer burden across multiple agencies and over a lifetime, building on an approach developed by Clive Belfield, shown here, an economist and two colleagues. Their groundbreaking research was conducted in 2012 for the White House Council for Community Solutions, supported by the Kellogg Foundation. The cohort of youth ages 16 to 24 we studied visited YouthLink. Uh, Minneapolis's largest drop-in center for homeless youth in 2011. We gathered costs from many local sources using Belfield's approach. This table shows the comprehensive excess costs to taxpayers for one year of services to our youth cohort. I don't have time for details, but note that total taxpayer costs for this cohort were nearly $30 million expressed in current dollars, or more than $20,000 per person. Keep in mind that I'm talking about about 1,451 unaccompanied youth, and the Wilder Foundation estimated very conservatively that there were 7,500 such youth in Minnesota in 2018, before the pandemic. We transformed these annual costs for our cohort into costs over time in order to estimate the lifetime burden to taxpayers. The arrow here represents age and years from 16 to 24, and then from 25 to 64. As you see, the expected lifetime taxpayer burden for this cohort is over $427 million, or nearly $300,000 per person. All these costs are expressed in present value, discounted at 3.5% per year. Next, we examine how much taxpayers spent on all interventions for the cohort in one year. Again, I must skip the details, but the total for one year of interventions, as you see, is $21.1 million. Knowing this, we examine how much taxpayers spent on all interventions for the cohort in one year and we conducted a break-even analysis. We asked how many youth would need to become financially self-sufficient at age 20 to offset the annual cost of all interventions for the entire cohort. Here's the answer. All 1,451 youth in the cohort are arrayed on the horizontal axis, and each adds about a quarter million dollars to the height of the line. That's the present value of what each will cost taxpayers from age 20 to 64. The slope reaches to more than $360 million. We learned that if 89 youth, just 6.1% of the cohort, became self-sufficient at age 20, the savings to taxpayers would fund all of the interventions for the entire cohort. So we don't have to succeed with all or even half of these youth to break even. In fact, if we succeed in helping just one in five to end their dependence on taxpayer-funded services, we would generate $50 million in savings to taxpayers above and beyond the annual cost of all services. That's why I believe this is a compelling business case. With such a low break-even, this is a low risk investment. We can afford to be bold because the lifetime cost of inaction is enormous. But while compelling, this opportunity is not simple for two reasons. First, the cost of prevention is clear and substantial as in this bill. While the savings will accrue over many years and are less visible, it is always difficult to quantify expenditures that would have been spent, but were not spent due to prevention efforts. That doesn't mean that the savings are not real. They are real. Thanks to Art Rolnick's advocacy, many elected officials have come to appreciate this about early childhood education. 
This is analogous. This is a critical window of opportunity to prevent a lifetime of dependency. Second, the costs I've described are spread over all levels of government and many different agencies. And the savings would also accrue variously to all these different entities. This makes it more challenging for any one level of government to justify making a large investment in prevention. Clearly, there is a compelling business case for investing in prevention in this area, but it will require a visionary group of leaders to make this investment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Foldis. And this is a very interesting research. Thank you so much for that. Um, anyone else uh, that would care to testify for or against House File 1791 as amended? Uh, and, and also, if, if Dr. Foldis and Mr. Grundahl could share their um, presentations with the committee, uh, that would be very good. So I've got a couple questions, we'll take two. I, and I still would like to get the one more bill, otherwise Ways and Means meets at six. I'm on that committee and a number of other members. We would have to come back after that, which could be about eight. So I'd like to still cover these two bills. So uh, Representative Joaquin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna thank Representative Gomez for bringing this forward. And um, having worked in the schools and I'm sure Chair Marquardt uh, has seen this as well. Kids don't come in pieces and when they walk in, when they don't uh, know when their next meal is gonna be or they don't have accessible health care or where they're gonna sleep that night, it directly affects um, their achievement. And this is one way we can do our part in helping to close the opportunity gap because adverse childhood experiences like homelessness are, are real, they make a big difference. And I just wanna thank uh, Representative Gomez for bringing this bill. Thank you very much. Representative Hurtas. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Gomez, for uh, the work that you're doing in this arena. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Gomez, I've followed this for a number of years with regard to homelessness. And one thing that I've learned is that there is uh, quite a broad definition of what constitutes being homeless. And uh, right down to many people, I guess, are counted as homeless even if they run away from home and uh, or go to a friend's house, uh, parents don't know where they are, or they're missing for a day or two. But, I, you know, I don't think there seems to be any continuity. Could one of you um, tell me if there's a clear definition which what constitutes homeless and, and whether or not they're included in this whole cohort? I think a lot of us think it's like long time, like more than a month or two months or something like that. But you clarify that for me. Uh, Representative Gomez. Thank you, Matt, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Hurtas. You're totally right that this is something that I'm encountering in my committee, right, is that there's not like one definition of homelessness. For the, for the purposes of this bill, however, because we did, um, because we're basing the allocation to counties of the, of the tax aid, um, we're, we're basing that allocation on the data that the Minnesota Department of Education collects about school age homelessness as, as a requirement of the McKinney-Vento Act. We use, we use that definition and it's sort of embedded in the bill, but it's about lacking a fixed, regular and adequate nighttime residence um, target, uh, um, sorry, living, excuse me, living in overcrowded conditions in their current housing, paying more than 50% of their income for rent or lacking a fixed, regular and adequate nighttime residence. And so that is just for that, again, it's, you know, they collect the, the data for McKinney-Vento two times during the year, in October and in March. And so we're asking the Department of Revenue to use the October numbers that, that are reported to the Department of Education. I hope that helps. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Gomez. Uh, I guess uh, that's something as we move forward on uh, combating this problem, we need to really uh, get a consistent cohort that or definition for the cohorts that are used in all of our help. Thank you. Representative Gomez, closing comments. Just really briefly, uh, you know, I know that this is a lot of money, but this is a this is a big issue. And this is exactly the kind of targeted, impactful investment in our families, in our children that we should be making with public resources, in my opinion. So I really appreciate you hearing the bill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And the revenue estimate is 53.02 million per year. So um, thank you very much, Representative Gomez, for bringing this important uh, topic to the committee. So Representative Gomez renews her motion to lay over House File 1791 as amended for possible inclusion into the omnibus tax bill. Thank you much. Representative Joachim, do you want to move your bill, House File 1914? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move House File 1914 before the committee, and I have an A1 amendment. All right. Yeah. How, Representative Joachim moves House File 1914 be laid over for possible inclusion into the omnibus um, tax bill. Uh, please proceed and, and move your, and Representative Joachim moves the A1 amendment. What does that say? The amendment allows counties, if they so choose, to collaborate and combine funds to make the grants allowed in this section. Very good. Um, any comments on the A1 amendment? If not, we're going to vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, aye. say nay. Uh, the motion does prevail. The A1 amendment is adopted. Chair Joaquin, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. And Chair. We, and, and we have to end in nine minutes, or we're coming back at 8 o'clock. So, Chair Joaquin. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. There uh, may need to be further adjustments to the language regarding the dates and uh, the report in this bill, but I know it's being laid over, so we can work on that. Uh, 1914 merely provides $50 million, uh, in fiscal year 2021 to counties to be used for grants to local businesses, which were required to temporarily close to public gatherings according to Executive Order 2099. Grants would be distributed by the counties in similar fashion. Um, that the $150 million were distributed at the end of the last year. Funds would be sent to counties proportionally according to their share of the state's population or at 100,000, whichever is greater. Members, this pandemic has hit our small businesses particularly hard. I've spoken to business owners and small business owners in my district that I know um, you all have too. Federal funds have cushioned some of the blow, as have the previous state funds that were distributed to fill the holes. This money would add to that support. Our counties have mechanisms in place to get this money out quickly and equitably as they know their communities needs best. I have folks with me today to further highlight the benefits of the distribution model and how the previous funds have been spent. Um, I've asked them to be brief, but now I ask them to be even briefer at one minute a piece if possible. Um, and then members note there's a letter of support in your electronic packets from the Minnesota Intercounty Association. Very good. So we thank you, Chair Joaquin. We've got three testifier, uh, testifiers. I'm going to give you one minute each. I want you to get right to the point of any concerns you have to the bill. So Ben uh, Danucci, uh, Tasca County Commissioner, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Ben Danucci. I reside in the Iron Range town of Nashwalk, and I'm a county commissioner in Itasca County. Um, I wrote about a three and a half minute testimony today, but I'll just get down to it. Uh, there are very unique situations occurring in, in our local communities. Uh, for example, the logging industry in my community is, is unique and we uh, have had the ability to allocate CARES funds to support the logging industry during uh, this very difficult time. Um, our, our local businesses are in touch with us as well as our economic development outreach people. And um, we've been able to put together um, grant programs that are fair and reasonable and um, have been to, to great benefit to our, our local businesses. So um, County, county government, local government uh, is very much in touch with the unique um, the characteristics of our, our businesses and uh, these types of uh, allocations um, are, are well distributed in our communities when we have the opportunity to do so. We're nimble and um, we take care of business. Thank you very much, Commissioner Danucci. Uh, next, we have Rebecca Young, Stevens County Administrator. Ms. Young, Thank please you. identify yourself. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Rebecca Young. I'm the Stevens County Administrator. I just want to, I had about a three minutes, so I'll go very quickly here. Um, the county really wanted a transparent, easily accessible process that um, the businesses could use in the county. We were able to get that 
published and out in four weeks and we got our awards out the door by February 16th, which was a very quick turnaround. But we realized that these were real people with real needs in real time and they needed that money very quickly. Um, the board did it directly here as many of my county partners and colleagues did. I feel that if you were to appropriate more money that we could very quickly and efficiently disperse that money out um, using the same processes that have already been established under CARES and the previous state relief business grant funding. Uh, these were much more difficult to award because the um, compare we had given out about 70% of our CARES money in business relief. And this was about 25% of what we had received previously. We had 1.12 million in request and we had 256, 250 to give out. We had 44 applicants, 37 qualified, and we only awarded 21, but we took the legislative's directive and were very intentional about those awards. We didn't take any money for administration. We felt like staff's wages were already levied and the, and the county could make a- Ms. Young, would you finish out, please? Yep. So I just would urge you that if there's some funding that you can give us, we can get that out very quickly. Um, we've had a lot of success stories. Awards range from six hundred to twenty-seven thousand dollars. So we were intentional about it. We took the directive that the legislator gave us, and um, we're able to get that money out within six weeks of award. Thank you very much. For sounds like it was very successful. Thank you, Mr. Hilgert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Matt Hilgert here with the Association of Minnesota Counties. Uh, counties responded quickly, efficiently, and creatively, and they adapted. Just like we did now, two bills, $100 million go into counties to help the community members, and we're trying to testify in three minutes. And we will continue to do our best to try to provide relief as the legislature dictates to it. I just want to leave folks with these stats. Um, in the last business relief round, 59 counties responded that they helped over 4,700 businesses. In the CARES Act round, 58 <coughs> counties responded that they helped 9,500 plus businesses. So that's over 15,000 businesses that were helped in your communities just via those two rounds alone. We have tons of lessons learned that we'd be happy to come back and share with the committee at a later time, but we are here to help and we appreciate your support. Um, and we'll be here uh, to get these funds out to our businesses that continue to express need. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. So it sounds like the counties are ready to go with this program they're familiar with. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. And Chair Iwa Kim, I would love to follow up with you at some later date. But my first question is, um, in previous rounds of this, we've had a clause saying that it would be reimbursed by federal money, and that's not in this bill. So would you entertain that? Um, Representative Mr. Joaquin. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Robbins, yes, that's part of the discussion about some language that may need to change. Perfect. Representative Thanks. Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And secondly, um, in previous iterations, and by the way, to the county folks, you guys have done a fantastic job, so thank you very much. Um, but in previous iterations, there were some criteria, I believe, and sometimes I get the D program and the county program mixed up, but we did have, businesses did have to show some sort of loss or harm due to COVID, and that's not in the text of this bill either. Would you entertain that? Representative Joaquin. Thank you, Representative Marquardt, uh, Chair Marquardt. I'd be more than happy to take this conversation offline um, because I'm not as familiar with those criteria. Great, I'll follow up. Thank Robbins. you. I'm all set. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, you know, I think there's more work. We want to make sure this is as flexible as possible. Uh, I think for um, all the, the counties to use to get to those businesses that have been, you know, most affected by the pandemic. So. Um, Chair Joaquin, closing arguments or, or statements. Thank you for your time and attention on questions today, Mr. Chair members. Sorry this was rushed, but this bill really focuses on our small business owners who have struggled the most during this pandemic. And as the chair said, we want to make sure that this is as flexible as possible so we can get this money out the door. And why this bill will not make them whole, it will provide some really needed relief for our small businesses. And I ask for your support. So Chair Joaquin, um, uh, moves the way over uh, for a possible consideration, House File 1914, as amended for a potential House tax omnibus bill. Members, thank you so much for that. We'll come back on all of these things in this bill uh, later, but thanks for everyone for the cooperation. And members, with that, we are adjourned.